Uh, evening, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown, doing this evening. Um, so this evening what we're looking at is busting market myths. And, and, and what this came, it so happened when we were planning the series of boot camps, we were doing it in May, which meant everyone was talking about sell in May and go away. Um, and and it's, it's the thing which I probably hate the most of anything. Um, and, and, and then we started, I started making other ones. You know, you, you, can, you can make any rhyme that you want that can fit into whatever. But there's a bunch of them, and we thought, let's go through them and, and we'll expand onto it and further. But bottom line, go dig the evidence. Let's see if we actually can make some money off this, or if they are bunk, or if they aren't bunk, how do we use them, and, and which ones are out there. So I went and dug around, and I found the, the most popular ones of them. We'll delve into those, and then some other bits towards the end as well. Obviously, we've got uh, the other sessions are available. This is our sixth. We are back in the new year again. We run until June. Uh, the first five are up. Um, you'll find them at uh, justonelap.com. You'll find them on YouTube at the same time as well, going through the process. And the plan is when we finish in June of next year, we'll have a complete library of the 12 sessions for traders to get, to get their hands into it. Um, as always, we stick off with, kick off with a, with a quote from someone this time, George Soros. Um, and he, what he's saying is, is, is that, Bubbles are based in reality. Absolutely they are. But it's, reality, it's distorted reality in a sense. And what I mean by that, and people will always tell you something's a bubble or something like that, Capitex a bubble or tech stocks or whatever the case may be. They might, be, they might seem to have no basis in reality, but there's something there. And that something is the germ which gets it going and gets it running. And then, of course, it's the fact that people believe it and with belief comes that bubble. The point of this is that bubbles are an absolute thing of beauty because bubbles can make you vast amount of money until it all goes pear-shaped and then you get the heck out of dodge. But if we look at the, the bubble in the commodity stocks in 2000 up to 2008, there was tons of money to be made. Um, and it's not about calling the top. It's about saying, you know, when, the end of, when this thing starts to, to fall, you get the heck out. Because when bubbles deflate, they, they don't. They pop. They explode. They go ugly. Um, there might be a bubble forming right now in property. Time will tell us. But, you know, don't be so dismissive and say, oh, it's a bubble and therefore I stay away. If it's a bubble and it's making you money, make the money. Don't be stressed by it. We'll absolutely take the money. So let's go into some of these rumors. As I said, sell in May and go away. When you look for stock market rumors, poems, myths, whatever you want to call them, this is by 100 miles the big one. This is the one that everyone talks about. And when you go and do the research, it's one of those things of beauty where you can find websites that prove it and websites that disprove it. And they're using the same data. And that actually, to me, is really actually the problem, is that if we can take the same, and when I say yeah, they're using the same data, I mean they're using the same calendar we use, right? You know, January, February, March, April, May. They're using the same data and that they're using the Dow Jones or the S&P. Um, and I was able to find five websites that prove it and five websites that disprove it out of the U.S., which really just means that, if anything, it's just fun poetry. The theory being is that you sell in May because ne returns are negative from May onwards, and then you buy again at a distant point in the future. And that's the point. And those are, these are the issues with them. When in May? May's got 30 days. Do we sell it the, the first week, the first day, the last day? Um, when, 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 when do we get back in again? Apparently, we get back in after Labor Day, which is a U.S. holiday. Um, but they still couldn't tell me when in May we sell. And that's why we can find people who prove it and people who disprove it. Why? They fudge the numbers. They fudge the date for when they actually do their selling in May. And, and, and the theory being is that, yeah, you sell everything, you absolutely go to panic. At some point in May, you magically decide that this is the right moment to exit, and you come back after Labor Day. And if you look at the, at, at the data, you could say to yourself, well, perhaps that's the, the weaker period. Does that sort of five-month or four-month window give a lot of, of negative returns? Uh, no, it, it gives a, a, a positive return as often as, as a negative one. The point being is, is, is trading's about strategy. And if your strategy is based on poems, I mean, that's cool. I mean, why not? I mean, poems, I mean, I mean it's, it's a little more loopy than some of the other strategies I've heard about. But it, I suppose it's a plan, and that's the first step in the process. But it, 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 you, you, you need to, and if, you're, if you want to do the sell in May, you've got to go and crunch those numbers on what you trade. And you've got to say, when we say sell in May, you sell on the, the, the second Tuesday in May and you sell at half past four in the afternoon or whatever it will be. 
The research I could find for South Africa, um, I could only find one guy who's done it in South Africa, and he, he debunks it completely. And if you go and eyeball a chart, the evidence is a little bit scant. And certainly if you go last year, um, from, from May, our market had a massive run-up to its all-time high and then proceeded to collapse. And if you had sold in May, you massively missed out on the process. So the sell in May and go away uh, sounds nice, a little bit of poetry, nothing wrong with that. Is it going to make you money and get you rich? The short answer is no. So then we have center rallies. And they actually kind of fit, right? Because if you sell in May and go away and then you buy in after Labor Day, well, then you're just in time for the Santa rally. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, I was, I think it was last week, I was on, on, on BDTV and, and you know, saying to David Shapiro, you know, does he get a Santa rally? Because he's, he's Jewish and, and, and he, doesn't, you know, he doesn't do Christmas. Um, and he was like, no, damn, he gets Santa rallies too. You know, don't bring his religion into it. The theory of Santa rallies is that markets rally in the lead up to Christmas. And this one's actually got some some logic behind it, in theory, because markets are quieter, because people are on holiday, people are going away, stockbrokers are going away, traders are going away, institutions are going away, et cetera, et cetera. So what that results in is a stock, is, is a market, when typically markets are quiet, the bias for a market is generally up. And I say generally because if, the, if, we, if, if, if we're in the middle of 2008, 9 or the dot-com bust or something, then the direction of the market is, is, is going to be fairly random to it. Um, what I couldn't find is the Santa rallies is when do you buy for the Santa rally. So the one theory is Thanksgiving, which was last Thursday. The other theory is 15 December. Um, and there's actually a ton of research on this one. And the truth of the matter is, as it does seem, uh, looking at both local data and also looking at international data, is that something crazy like, like, like 88 or 90 percent of the time is you have positive Decembers. And then you stop and you say, whoa, hang on a second. If we're getting positive Decembers 88, 90 percent of the time in the index, there's something here. I mean, let's, let's skew it and let's say it's 80 percent of the time. So four out of five Decembers, we're going to get positive returns. It gets skewed because if we go back to 06, 07, 08, we had three years in a row where we had red Decembers, and that's always the problem with stats. The fact that, on average, four out of five are green doesn't mean that after a red one you have four green ones, because we had 06 red, we had 07 red, by 08 you were betting the bank, and well, 08 was red too. You had to wait four years for your next green one. So there's some validity to it. Uh, I think, who was it on Twitter? I think it was Karen Richards who posted something on Twitter last week as well, also looking at local data, and she's saying you buy on the 15th. But that comes back to the point of it. Are we really going to be brave enough to just go and buy, and let's pick the 15th, as I, let's make it this, you know, the 15th of December. Are we really going to be brave enough to go and buy a, 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 an index, because we're looking at indices rather than stocks? randomly on the 15th of December because most times it goes higher. And that's the problem with these theories, is that there's something to it. Yes, the, 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 the Santa rallies do seem to happen to a degree, but is it really tradable? Can we can really put our money into it, take it a step further from that? Can we, can we really take it in a sense, put our money into it, manage the risk properly? I mean, where's our stop loss on it? Yeah, if you, let's go back to sell in May. If we sell in May, whenever we might sell, um, I suppose we don't have a stop loss, but what happens if markets start running and now we're missing out? I mean, do we have a, a mulligan clause in a sense? Um, you know, Mark Ashton and I are, are, are petitioning the JSC. We want mulligan clauses. Eh? We want to be able to undo one trade a month or something like that. So far, they're not giving us any responses. <laughs> but you suddenly... I, you know, you're suddenly saying, I'm going to use this theory, this, 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 the evidence is there that we get ourselves Santa rallies. But we need more than just, hey, there's a Santa rally, let's buy something. You've got to put your stop losses in place. Again, you've got to decide, what is your exit strategy? Is it that you, that you sell at half past 12 on the 31st of December? Um, and, and in fact, sell at 12 o'clock because the market closes half day on the 30th of December. Or do you just let it run or do you put a trading stop loss on it? And as soon as we start bringing all those bits and pieces into it, suddenly it's like, well, okay, we're no longer actually using some, some fancy poetry or something. We're actually just, now we're being methodical about it and there's process to it. And that brings us back to 
Well, what's wrong with our existing plan? If the market's going to rally in December, if we're going to get a center rally, surely our system is going to give us a buy signal. And we will get on that bus at some point. And we might be a little early, we might be a little late. The point being is that if this happens to be one of the years when it isn't going to rally, well, that's fine because we don't get, we don't get caught in the wrong bus because our, our, our system hasn't given us signals. And then the other really, really weird one was presidential cycles. Apparently, markets are weakest in the year after a new U.S. president. So I look at that and I say, well, okay, what qualifies? I mean, f my first question was, when Barack Obama got elected and for his second term in office, does that count? And I couldn't find anyone who actually would tell me either way. Um, <clears throat> further to that, you know, does it matter if it's, if it's uh, 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 the Republicans or the Democrats? Does that make a difference? And again, they seem to be fairly agnostic on that. Um, are you telling me that I must sell everything after the election? And is it after the election or after the inauguration? And those two dates are elections early November, inaugurations late January. Um, and, and do we just stay out of the market for the whole year? So again, it sounded like fun, but there was, there was little scant evidence to it. And it, it comes to the point. The reason I think we find lots of these sort of... Uh, uh, rhymes and poems and theories and the like. And it comes to a cognitive bias we have that as human beings we love to see patterns. We love to say, we love to see something and think, oh, it fits in here. And that's why people can see puppy dogs in the clouds. And, and, and trust me, I, I flew to Durban yesterday in really, really cloudy weather. It was the worst flight I've had all year. Man, there were no puppy dogs in those clouds. So it was just... It was just my aeroplane bouncing, and I mean bouncing. When the captain screams over the intercom, stop serving coffee, you know you're in for trouble. Um, the point being is we, we want these patterns. We want these, these comforts almost in a sense. Because how cool is it if we can almost abdicate the personal responsibility to a nice little rhyme that says sell in May? And then if we don't make money, it's almost the rhyme's fault rather than ours. And we want it to be as simple as, well, if you just sell in May and, and, and go away, everything's fine. And, and then you buy for the Santa rally. And, and the year after year selection, no, no, never. You know, in this, you know, and, and, and we can suddenly try and distill trading into a couple of little sound bites, which is deeply attractive. If, if we can make trading just a few little rhymes instead of all of the effort and all of the, the work and the time that we have to put into it. And this is what we want. We want that, we want that straight line, A to B. Sell in May, Santa Rally, presidential cycle, boom, just deposit the money in my bank account. Actually, that's just what we want. Just, you know, give your bank account number to your stockbroker and they'll just funnel money in every couple of weeks. They'll deposit more money into your account. I mean, that's the ideal, right? I mean... The truth is, it's a heck lot more messy. And that's the whole point. And it's like the sale in May, where I could find as much evidence to prove it as disprove it. And what it says to you, in truth, that's what trading is, right? So you've got a trading system. You've got yourself some buy and sell signals, whatever you're using. Maybe you're using chart patterns, oscillators and indicators, maybe support and resistance, whatever you're doing. You've got yourself a, a strategy, and this is how you trade it. And again, what do we think when we've got that strategy? We think it's just going to be a nice, we go from A to B. It's going to be nice and simple. And then we find out it's a whole lot messier. You know, not only is it, is it harder than just saying, well, okay, so we, we, we buy on the breakout or whatever the case is. Now suddenly we've got to define what's a breakout and when does it count and how much do we buy and where do we put our stop losses. Um, and a system that works. And, and I'll use my, my lazy Aussie system, which is, a day, which is a daily system trading the Aussie futures. Um, and it, it, it does the squiggly bit all the time. I mean, I will have seven or eight losing trades in a row. And almost every time I get to seven or eight losing trades in a row, you get to that point where you're starting to say, you know what, I think it's time to stop trading the system. You know, it's just like, and as sure as Murphy is watching, next trade is the big winner. Um, but it's not as clinical as that. So last time, this year, I was having a really tough time on the system. It wasn't doing me much money at all. In fact, no, that's a lie. It was losing me money. And we get to losing trade number six. And I'm like, ah, but the seventh trade is usually a winner then. Seven trade, losing. Oh, then definitely the eighth trade's a winner. Eighth trade, loser. And at that point, I'm like, you know what? I want out. 
because hell, man, we, you, you're pushing my chances here. And, but, but the one thing I've learned, and I've learned it the hard way, is to stick to the process. Um, and I'm allowed, I allow myself to change my trading systems. I allow myself to abandon trading systems. And I allow myself to create new trading systems. But there's a simple rule. I can do it in a four-week window from 16 December onwards. I can't, in the middle of August, decide to abandon a trading system. Because what am I doing? I'm responding to the emotion. I'm responding to the fear of losing money. I'm responding to the pressure. I'm responding to the noise, quite frankly, the noise of the market, which is costing me money. Um, and I, so what I do is I, I make notes during the course of the year. Uh, someone on Twitter said to me that I should never be short in the week of futures closeout. And he said, absolutely. He says, if you, you know, futures closeout is, as a rule, is a, is a positive week. You should never be short in the week of futures closeout. Um, and, and then he tweets me like a week later and says, so have you changed your system? And the answer is no. 16 December, well, not the 16th. 16th of December, I play computer games and drink from breakfast. It's the start of the holidays. Why are you looking at me, Squiff? <laughs> um, so 17 December, if the hangover isn't too bad. I sit down, and over the course of the year, what have I done? I've got notes. I've got notes from ideas I had around my systems. I've got notes from, 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 for example, don't go short in the week of the futures closeout. That sort of stuff. I, and I've abandoned it, and I haven't thought back to that at all. What I will do on the 17th is I will sit down, I will open my notes, and I will then say, okay, so this chap said that you shouldn't be short in the day of the futures closeout. First part of the process, go and see if there seems to be some evidence of this. Is, is it true that most weeks of the futures closeout are positive weeks? If, excuse me, if the answer is yes, that's the first st step in the process. The second step I've got to take in the process is, okay, how do I fit this into my system? Do I create a completely subsystem that says, you know what you do? Uh, in the close on Friday, the week before the futures close out, go long. And actually just have a new system that trades four times a year. Every futures close out you buy, because futures close out is Thursday. So what you do is every, every Friday beforehand, or maybe it's the Monday, we've got to do the digging. Do we have a new system that says a week before futures close out, go long the Aussie? And then you've got to put your risk in. Then you've got to put a stop loss in. You've got to say, do I just wait until close out? Or if I get 1,500 points or 500 points, do I take it? Do I implement it into a current trading system? And that current trading system, you know, what would happen if I'm approaching close out and I am short of the market? At what point do I then say, well, hang on, my rule says don't be short in the week of closeout. Does that mean I close out, I close the position on, again, the Friday ahead of the Thursday? Do I close it on the Monday or the Tuesday? And the key point is that none of these are right or wrong. And I'm, you know, the evidence can tell you whether the futures closeout week is strong or not. But whether I close on a Friday or a Monday will make differences, yes. Over a lifetime of trading, I don't know what those differences will be. Would I be richer if I always closed on a Friday or if I always closed on a Monday? Yes, but I don't know what that difference is until I'm 10 or 20 years older. Whatever it is, we've got to find a way that logically and practically, and perhaps practically is the most important part, implement it into our trading systems. There's no rules about what we can or can't include into a trading system. And that's one of the hardest parts of trading. I say to folks, you need a trading system. They're like, yeah, cool. Uh, what are the ground rules for a trading system? Oh, no ground rules. You know, n none whatsoever. You know, what indicator should I use? Oh, whichever one you like the most. There's no, there's no, you know, if you, if you join a new job, there's ground rules, right? They give you an access card, and, and this is where you park, and this is what time you get to work, and you, know, and you get into a new relationship, and there's ground rules. You, know, you, you put the toilet seat down. Or, all of, there's always ground rules. There's always ground rules. And trading, no ground rules. And as much as the anarchists in us is quite attracted to this idea, oh, yay, no ground rules, in truth, as human beings, it distresses us greatly. We need certainty. We crave certainty. And in trading, we have a name for it. We call it the uncertainty principle. 
I used to say there was one thing that was certain in the stock market. We open at 9, we close at 5. And then the one day the JC had technical problems. So we opened at 2 and closed at 7. So now there's no certainty in the market whatsoever. And the way I view it, and, and this worked for me, I view this as <clears throat> it's like the universe. And I can't comprehend the universe. So what have we got? I think, so we sit in a, a we're a galaxy, and then the solar system, the solar system's a galaxy, so, I mean, just space, right? Space is incomprehensibly large. And when you want to become a trader, and I say you need a trading system and a process and a plan, and you say, where do you start? Basically, I point to space, and I say, go find yourself five square meters of space and make it yours. And, 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 and it, it overwhelms us. Most people are like, whoa, you know what? I'm going to be a jockey instead, or whatever the case may be, because we're overwhelmed by that choice. So with all of these, firstly, it is that it's not A to B. The best system in the world is going to be wonky at times. Because a system is designed to operate in certain circumstances, <coughs> excuse me, and we can always identify those circumstances in hindsight. So I'm a trend-based trader, right? I trade trends. So the first thing you want to do as a trend-based trader is don't enter trades when the market is going sideways. Yeah, well, welcome to hell because there's no way of knowing when a market is going. So I can tell you right now that our market has gone sideways for a year, pretty much. Richmond has gone sideways for two and a half years. I know that because I bought it once at 102 Rand and then I could have bought it last week at 102 Rand. And I bought it in August 2013. So what we want to do as a trend-based trade is really simple. Is find a way to say, when is the market going sideways? And when the market is going sideways, we sit in our hands and wait. And there is nothing. So we can do things such as ADX, which is designed not to tell you the direction, but the strength of a trend. So we can do ADX. That seems quite cunning. We can do some moving averages. There's a lot of things which in theory work. The problem with being a trend-based trader is that you daren't miss that big trade. My, my, my Aussie system last year made me, it's embarrassing to admit, but I think it made me 20 rand per contract for the entire year. Um, I might have made more money if I put it in the bank and left it alone. The point being is that if I removed the one winning trade, which I did from April to July to the all-time high, we had an all-time high on the 4th of July. If I remove that single trade, I lost 1,800 points of contract. So as soon as I start to bring those filters in to <clears throat> not trade when the market is going sideways, I run the risk of missing that one trade that turned my year from a horrible minus 1,800 points per contract to a positive 20 points. And I think it was 20 rand, not 20 points, which means I made two points of contract last year on my Aussie system. And, and what is human nature doing? Human nature, our cognitive biases, is saying to us, we want to remove the horrible experiences. And horrible experiences is trader code for, we want to stop losing money. So we want to try and overcomplicate the process. And by doing that, we actually don't bring better returns. We don't bring stability to the process. What we do is we miss some good trades. We bring anxiety because our system said don't do anything. And then the market went to the moon and we were standing there saying, no, no, don't. So what do we do? And we come back to the point I always make. We just make it simple. We make it as simple as possible. And that means we're going to catch a lot of buses. And the majority of those buses are like, going to be at the depot and like you know I don't know if it's ever happened to you you get on the bus and you notice the driver is getting off the bus and it's like hmm, noted go get another bus and we're going to get a lot of buses which as soon as we get on the bus the driver gets off but occasionally we'll get the bus that goes somewhere and what we've got to do rather than massively try and, and, and remove and, and trade. And I'm not suggesting we try and trade more. I'm not saying do hundreds of trades. What I'm saying is, is, is try and, 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 and get a simple system and then just trade it. And that simple system can be based on, on anything. We can base it on sell in May and go away. 
but take sell in May and go away and turn it into a proper trading system. When in May? What's your stop loss? So what? Are you going short or just exiting positions? Go away until when? In other words, a trading plan rather than a poem. And to simplify it down. And a point before I move on, the important point is, is, re, is, 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 is resist change. In other words, it come, I said always, it's about the discipline, right? Doing the same thing, doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason every single time. That's what makes a trader. The analogy I use is learning to drive a car. We can drive cars unconsciously but competently because we're all here this evening because we have done that so often. And you think back to the first time you had to change the clutch. And that whole clutch accelerator, basically it was just a complicated... You, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you folks were better. I just stalled every time for... And then when I didn't stall, I went straight into the wall. My father had said, don't drive into the wall. What else was I going to do? It was like a magnet. If we're constantly chopping and changing, where's our discipline? What are we disciplined to? Where's our consistency? The flip is, we can't say we will never change. Because maybe there's an error in our system, or maybe our system doesn't actually work for us. So it comes to the point, is create that window when you will review the system and have it set down. And, and to me, f for me personally, the December holidays is perfect because I work in this industry and this industry shuts down. If you work in hospitality or, 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 or emergency services, December is probably not your quiet period. So then go pick a different period. And during the course of the year, when you have ideas about how you can improve or something like that, you keep a note. I've got a folder in my computer. Um, and I'm not even quite sure what's in it. I know there's the one point about the futures. I know there's another point because I, I remember hunting out the, far, the earlier in the year. And I'll open on the 17th and be, you know, see what there is, do some digging. It's not a particularly lengthy process. But what it does is it, it's almost like the Formula One racing in a sense. You can race lots, but you can only do the testing in small little windows. And we need to tweak our systems, and we need to be ruthless will it, with it. Will I implement the, the futures one? I honestly don't know, but I will be cautious about doing it. It's about what we see. In a sense, a chart, which is price data, and if we want we can include volume, but let's just say it's price data, is about the simplest thing out there, particularly a line chart. You know, it's just like wiggles along. It, it, it's about the simplest thing out there. Our cognitive bias says to us, complexity is about success. But think of the huge successes. At their core, there might be complexity, but the ideas are not. Amazon. Amazon's not complex. Amazon's just, you know what? If I do this stuff, if I sell books online, I don't need to have a bookshop. Man, I save on rent. Boom, this has got to be winning. Uber. Uber's just a simple idea of, hey, people want taxis, but have you ever tried to get hold of a taxi? Well, why don't I do something and put it on your phone? Now, the technology behind Uber and in that app, yes, complexity. But the core ideas are simplicity. And we always... It's almost a case of if we think Uber is simple, we almost uh, sort of disparage it. Instead of saying simple is beautiful, simple is ultimately what we want. Complexity brings in all the risk of mistake and error and interpretation. We want it to be simple. We want to basically be able to look at a chart and say, we know what's happening here. We know what we're supposed to do. Let's do it. Instead of going onto Twitter in April and saying to everyone, okay, guys, the sale in May. Which day? Because you're going to get 30 answers, aren't you? Ranging from the 1st of May to the 30th of May. Ah, no, not the 1st because it's a public holiday. You're going to get 29. Less the weekends, you're down to 21 days. We mustn't be scared. And I, and I scared is the wrong word. We must be comfortable in the simplicity of trading rather than trying to find the complexity in it and thinking that trading needs complexity. 
as I said, so I mean, you speak to the traders, and I mean, I'll use you two examples, uh, I'll use you three examples out there. Um, Petri Radenhaus, Garth McKenzie, um, no, not so much Garth, he doesn't do Twitter. Petri Radenhaus, uh, Igor, I can't say his surname, he's Serbian, uh, he's Aussie trader on Twitter, um, and Corin Richards. You know what they do? They post a chart, and they can explain the entire logical reason for their system within that picture. In other words, two or three lines of text. And I remember chatting with Igor, I think it was last year, um, and he was saying, yeah, he wants to, you know, if he's saying that trading, that anyone can do it, the way he wants to prove to himself that, he, that, that his statement is correct is he wants to be able to basically explain a system in a tweet. Okay, so he cheats, he puts a picture in. But he's not using much more than, you know, maybe he's using 300 characters instead of 140. And even Garth McKenzie. If, you know, and the reason I pulled him from the list is because he's not on Twitter, but of course he's on Business Day TV. And you go look at Garth McKenzie, and you go and look at his trading systems. They're simple. You know, he's got some, he uses a bit of background, a bit of uh, perspective to it. And then he's got a breakout or something, a bit of indicator or oscillator confirming. He's got his risk, he's got a stop loss, he's got his target. The good trader explains the system to you in a minute or two. The trader who takes half an hour to explain the system to you doesn't understand their system. And if they don't understand it, it's not making them money and it's not going to make you money either. It's always about that simplicity. We spoke about that when we talk about unconscious competence. How do we get from conscious competence where we're overanalyzing, being influenced by news, poems on the interwebs. How do we move from that point to the unconscious competence? We get to the unconscious competence by, by stopping to think, by doing, by the repetition. And we get to the previous step, the conscious competence, by the simplicity. Simplicity is a critically important step in the evolution of a trader. So from there we get to the get rich quick. Because we're in a hurry, we've got plans for the weekend, and we want to make money. And it's really, really, really quite simple. There's one way we get rich in a hurry. Marry money. You know, in the olden days, you could rob banks. But these days, banks don't have money, and they, in fact, they don't even bother to shoot back. I mean, they've got a security guard. He doesn't have a gun anymore, because there's no money in the bank. Trading can become huge. I, the, the phrase I, I glibly throw around, and I appreciate it's a glib phrase, is freedom from ties that bind. Trading can take us to a point where, where you, you, you're doing something because you enjoy it. And I'm not talking trading, because you don't want to be trading 8 to 10 hours a day. But you are doing your job, whatever it may be, because you want to do it, not because how the majority of the planet are doing it, because if we don't do our job, in no time at all, we're living on the streets. You know, we, we do it because we have to. Because this is how we survive, not because we love it. And that's what we're trying to get to. Um, creating piles of cash is possible, but it is a process. It is not an event. It is not going to happen in a hurry. It is not going to happen this year or next. It's probably not even going to happen this decade. And I know that's a terrible answer because really this is, a, I mean, the decade's half gone, but really we want to be rich, if not by Friday, at least by 2020. And that's probably not going to happen either. For a bunch of reasons. <clears throat> the one is, is that we look at it and we say, you know what? All I need is one giant killer trade. All I need is to have bought Capitec at one rand. And in fact, the PSG numbers are better, but I can't remember what they are. Bought Capitec at one rand and 13 years later sold it at 600. Bought famous brands at a buck 46 when Kevin Hedewick took over in 2000 and sold it yesterday for 141. Um, bought PSG. I don't know what the returns were, but probably even better. The truth is that none of that would have helped us. I mean, let's go back to 2001 when Capitec is listing, notwithstanding that Sumbo goes, goes into liquidation on the weekend and Capitec lists on Tuesday. So you're quite brave to be buying an unknown, untested uh, small bank two days after Sumbo went bust. But hey, you're brave. You're here. You want to get rich in a hurry. You've got plans. You have to take, uh, how much money are you going to stick in there? I mean, a thousand rand? Okay, nice. A thousand rand, you've now got 600,000. You put 10,000, you've now got 6 million. Did you put a million rand in? 
Did you have a million to put in? And if you did have a million, were you really taking your entire million bucks that you own? You're going to take a slice, a small sliver of your net worth, and you're going to put it into Capitec. And then it, forget 10 bagger, Capitec is a 600 bagger, and that's nice, and it certainly moved you along the path. But Capitec on its own is not going to have made you the money. Uh, Lonman the other day was trading at what, 30 cents? And suddenly, boom, it's trading at a buck 25. And everyone's saying, oh, if only we'd known we would be rich. Okay, unless you took your entire net worth and put your entire net worth into, Lon into Lonman at 30 cents and were able to sell it at, at 125, you've quadrupled your entire net worth. Pause a moment. And it's going to depend on your age. But is quadruple, if you quadruple your, your net worth in a moment, is that it? Can you retire forever in a day? Uh, some of you perhaps yes, some of you undoubtedly no. It's not about the single trade. No one trade is going to see you. I mean, I did a phenomenal trade. I bought Dye Data at the equivalence of five and a half cents in 1987 and sold it uh, five and a half cents because it did a split while I owned it. Paid five and a half cents for it and sold it for 64 rand and 80 cents. My, in that case in point, I did put my entire net worth into Dye Data. I was 18. It was 120 bucks. <laughs> it was everything I owned. And yes, when I sold it at 64 and 80, it was very nice. It, it was, but I, I didn't at that point sell my dad daughters, phone up my wife and say, that's it, sweetie. Can spay, here we come. You know, we paid off some debt, paid off some cars, you know, put some money in the bond, had a good dinner or 12, and that was like, thank you, dad daughter. So it's never going to be about the one trade. It's about that consistency. Trading is, and I know I hop it, and I know I keep on coming back to it because it's so critically important, it's about that consistency. It's about the repetition. And, I mean, the numbers are simple. So, the question is, how much, can, how much, how much what return can you expect in a year? And the answer is, how long is a piece of string? So then I turn to people who are really, really good at this. And folks like um, Garth McKenzie do 50% a year. I don't know what his numbers are for this year, but I think the last two or three years, he's done 50% every year for two or three years. That is a phenomenal number. That's an insanely crazy number. I mean, my target is 30%. If I can do 30% a year, you know, I'm twice ahead of the market, which is doing 15. Now, I'm going to get richer than any unit trust man can make me, or lady. It's just going to take some time in the process. If you do 40% a year, you double your money in two years. And initially, that's nothing. So you start with 10 grand, and you double your money in, in, in two years. And you, you're going nowhere, but you've got 20. And in four years, you're at 40. And at eight years, you're at 160. And in, uh, uh, no, my math is going wrong then. Two years, you're at, you're at 20. In four years, you're at uh, 40. Six years, you're at 80. Um, at eight years, you're at 160. Ten, you're at 320. But you can see, at, at, all of a sudden, you're at tens and tens of millions. But it didn't happen initially. It went slowly, and you've got to bear through it. You've got to have that consistency. It's going to take you 10 or 20 years to do it. And if you don't have the consistency, it's, you, you never, I mean, this is a long, long game. There's little that we as human beings these days start and really honestly say, we're going to be doing this in 20 years' time. Certainly not our jobs. I mean, who joins a company these days and says, yeah, I'll be there in 20 years for the, for the platinum watch? Actually, we don't want a platinum watch, do we? <laughs> um, what do they make fancy watches out of these days? I'm trying to think of something that's valuable. Um, I, I, <laughs> red wine, just give me red wine. Um, you know, I mean, maybe we could say relationships, but I'm not even, I'm, look, I'm not going to go down that road. But, but you know, w what are we sitting here today and saying this is for 20 years? So we've got to go into a space which is not our normal zone of space. But in trading, we've got to say this is a 20-year a, a game. And it's going to work. And, and, and you're going to benefit from it. The real beneficiary is going to be your kids. I mean, they're going to love you to death. Death being the operative part because they get the money. 40% <laughs> a year doubles it in two year, every two years. Garth McKenzie's target is always 4% a month. 4% a month, if you can grow your portfolio 4% a month, you get a tenfold increase in five years. So your 10,000 is 100,000 in five years' time. 
And that is deeply boring. So in 2020, you're worth 100 grand. Nothing. In 2025, you're worth a million. Meh, starting to look up. In 2030, you're worth 10 million. And in 2035, you're worth 100 million. It's like, hmm, 20 years, 100 million? I can do that. I could try to like to spend 100 million rand because then I would be 66. I'd have 30 years of life. Try to spend 100 million in 30 years. Yeah, that's my concern. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. First, I mean, yeah, you go buy a wine farm and there's half of it and probably doesn't make wine. But yes, this is the real McCoy. And that's just off 4% a month, which is, so 4% a month compounded is, trying to do the math, 58% a year, which is slightly better than what Garth is doing at the moment. He's hitting 50 a year. So we can do it, just not this year, and probably not next either. So then the nuts and bolts is how much? How much do we need to start with? And I used to have a fairly simple answer. I used to say to folks, 100,000 Rand. If you ain't got it, save, you need 100,000. A couple of things happened. Firstly, when I would say that, is the room would empty out. Like, you know. <laughs> with like, if I had 100K, would I be here tonight? I'd be out in Santon living at large. Maybe Rosebank, because Santon is expensive. But nonetheless. Um, and I'd say to folks, but don't worry, you can save. And then the half you hadn't left, then left. But then it also occurred to me, hang on a second. If you've got 100K, the worst thing in the world, and you're a novice trader, the worst thing in the world is to take your 100,000 Rand and a novice trader and trade your 100,000. Because probably you'll end up with nothing. And that's really, really, really not a good idea. So then I got to thinking about it. Then I started asking questions and chatting with folks. And, and, and the answers came back. Some people said it's got to be 250, et cetera, et cetera. But what's the key point? The key point is how do we learn? We learn in situations like this. We learn via books, courses, videos, downloads, mentoring, all of that. But we really learn by doing. At the pointy coal face is how we truly, truly learn. And that's everyone. The brain surgeon, the plumber, the accountant, and the trader all learn by doing. So then I say, well, hey, heck, hey, that's cool. Then actually stress less about how much money we need. Stress more about doing it properly, having a system, having a process. I, I was running numbers um, yesterday trying to decide, I mean, could one trade with a thousand rand? Could you start trading with a thousand rand? And I want to say no. In truth, you actually can. I mean, you're not going to do it incredibly well because you can't do proper risk management on a thousand. There's no two percent rule with a thousand bucks. Eh? I mean, there's one rule there. It's, but all you've got to do is find a broker with low cost and no minimum, um, and boom, you can actually trade with a thousand. And what kills you mostly is the minimums. So you could start with a thousand. Are you likely to turn that thousand rand into profit? Probably not. If nothing else, costs are going to slay you in the process and everything else. But what do you get by starting to trade with a thousand rand? You get your hands dirty. You get a real sense for what it's like the first time you push the buy button and the bloody machine pops up and says, are you sure? Because <laughs> the answer is, no, I am not sure. <laughs> that is the worst design feature in the whole wide world. I know why they do it. But please, I'm sitting there rattled, scared, heckless. And the system says, are you sure? And I can just imagine everyone in the world is like looking, <laughs> is he sure? <laughs> but what does it do with that thousand bucks is you get that, that, that rush. And initially, it's a rush of adrenaline. And then in time, as I always say, trading will become boring. If you're having fun trading, you're probably losing money. But you get that first, I'm going to buy a share. Are you sure? No. I mean, the first time I got asked, am I sure? I just shut the browser down. And then in those days, because of old technology, if you shut the browser down without a logout, the site logged you. You couldn't log in for half an hour. 
So then I come back feeling brave, I'm sure. And the site's like, no, you can log in in 15 minutes' time. It's like, I might not be sure in 15 minutes. I don't... What I'm saying is, so everyone says go paper trade. Yeah, paper trade, lacquer, monopoly money, you know, uh, um, uh, these fictitious things. Uh, do you learn stuff there? No. You learn one thing. You learn how very quickly you can make bad decisions and lose money. Because what do you do? You've got a million bucks of fake money. What do you do? You go find the riskiest thing in the world. You put a million bucks into it, and your million bucks goes to zero. And you're like, pruh, that didn't work. No one ever paper traded properly because it's just deadly boring. Because there's no skin in the game. A thousand rand is skin. And as soon as you've got skin in the game, now it's real. Now you're actually going to do things properly. You're going to start to experience what we talk about. You're going to start to experience the emotions. You're going to start to experience the fear and the greed. You're going to start to understand what happens, how things happen. You're going to understand the process of the broker. You're going to know that next time you hit the buy button, the pop-up is going to say, are you sure? And you're going to be ready. And you're going to bat it away and say, man, I was born sure. Are you going to make money with your thousand rand? No. Is it going to give you invaluable lessons? Yes. And lessons you can't buy any other way. So, to my mind, around 10 is probably the base entry point. If you've got 100, really simple, take 85 of it, put it in a bank account earning 5% a year, trade with 15. In a year's time when you're doing well with the 15, take, you know, slowly, don't take the 100 because you'll lose that and it'll be even worse. So, when people say to me, how much do I need to start trading now? I say to them, look, understand that at certain points it's going to be hard. Below 10 it's going to be really, really hard. But what you're learning is invaluable. Don't stress the number so much. But don't say to yourself, ah, it's only a thousand rand, what the hell if I lose it? A thousand rand in 20 years time and today at, at put it, you buy, go buy an ETF. 1,000 Rand in 20 years' time, and today's money is five or six grand. Oh, that's a nice bottle of wine. In fact, it's a nice case of wine. Insider trading and smart money. I'll touch briefly on the insider trading. Are there crooks? Yes, there are crooks. Don't stress them. Just don't worry about the insider traders. Stuff happens. Peter Redmond at the JSC probably catches all of them. We are the only exchange in the world that does real-time monitoring of it. More importantly, uh, top regulated exchange globally three years in a row. Don't worry about the insider traders. They are, they're crooks. They will always be crooks. Are they making money? Yeah, perhaps, maybe. Does, has anyone ever gone to jail? No. Greg Blank went to jail, but it wasn't for insider trading. Um, usually you just pay a fine. Usually you pay a fine to say, I'm not guilty, but how about a big, large amount of money to make you go away? But the one I really hate is what we call smart money. So what is smart money? So smart money is the insiders buying and selling, i.e. directors. Smart money is Sunlum because they've got lots of money, so they must be smart. Smart money is the rich man who's driving a, a Ferrari. With respect, anyone here drive a Ferrari? Promise? Okay. With respect, anyone who spends five million rand in a car is not smart. Just saying, hey? I mean, come on. But there's a sense that we see a big trade go through. Ah, oh, the smart money. No. I mean, I don't know. My money doesn't talk back to me. And just because you've got money doesn't mean you're smart. There are plenty of people who've got lots of money who are plenty dumb. And there are plenty of smart people who've got no money. I mean, we're all smart, right? None of us are driving Ferraris. So, insiders, what I want to touch on here, particularly, and I'm here I'm using insiders in the sense of the directors. Who knows best about a company? The board of directors. So, board, so directors are selling. Who cares? Why is a director selling? We have no idea. It could be because I think the company is about to go bankrupt. Yes. Although you'll note the African bank directors didn't sell. The, implant, uh, the London directors didn't sell. Just saying. So it could be because they think the company is about to go bankrupt. It could be because they've got a hot date next week and they need some cash. Maybe they're buying a Ferrari. Tax liability. Tax, uh, there, there are infinite number of reasons why a director would be selling. There's one reason why they buy. Because they think the share will go up. 
unless they're doing cookery and actually they know something that we don't, in which case they'll get a phone call from Peter Redman and the JSC surveillance team. What I got down here is Capitec. So <clears throat> at that point there with Capitec, all of the selling, everyone was like, ooh, the directors are selling, ooh, Capitec's game over, ooh, this is all so terrible. And there was big selling. And in fact, on this one particular, now we're going back to, that's November 14, one, one point there was almost a billion rand of director selling in a single month. And it all happened with Capitec at under 350 rand. Capitec is now over 600. The people who should know Capitec best. Now, were they selling because they thought it was expensive? Maybe. I, that's one of the reasons you might be selling. You might sell your shares because you think the stock is expensive. But understand the distinction between they know the business and they know the stock market. <coughs> the directors of Capitec know Capitec better than anybody else. Of course, they are the directors. Does that mean that they know how stock markets work? I mean, superficially, yes. But stock markets are irrational places. Capitec at 600 Rand is the craziest thing I have. Pause for a moment. August last year, Mon uh, the Sunday, African Bank goes into creatorship, liquidation. What did we call it? Uh, creatorship, I think we did. African Bank goes bust. Joe Marcus is like, cuts the knees off. African Bank is over. This happens on Sunday afternoon. Monday morning, before our market opens, Moody's does a double downgrade on Capitec. Capitec price collapses, trades at 200, 200 and 495 Rand. That was August last year, now it's 600. Short answer. What are the directors doing? Don't care, don't know, don't matter. What I hope they're doing is actually I do care. I hope they're running the company. But are they buying and selling shares? If they're buying, I'm interested. If they're selling, it doesn't bother me in the least. But also understand the point. When YT Basson, now let's use, um, who's the boss? Christo Visa. When Christo Visa comes along and he buys... 100 million rand of ShopRite shares. That's like me going to the store and buying Coca-Cola, hey? 100 million. That man, that man is worth, what's he worth now? 75 billion rand. 100 million for him is petty cash. It's nothing. He's the man who got caught with 700,000 pounds in his suitcase at London Airport, which is, what's that? I'm trying to do the math. It's about 3 million rand. And when they arrested him, he's like, but they're spending money. That was his answer. It's 700,000 pounds to him is spending money. He was going to Paris. He wanted some cash. I want cash. I draw two grand. Rands, not sterlings. <laughs> so don't see a director buying and get terribly excited about it because it's relevant. It, you know, it depends who the director is and their net worth, and we oftentimes don't know about it. Don't worry about the, the director's selling, and don't give a hoot about the institutions. So what were they all doing last year? Buying Capitec. Until the last minute, literally that last week, is when Coronation, who had the, the second biggest holding, I think PRC was biggest, then Coronation. Coronation started selling on the Tuesday. And that's what caused the price to collapse from 10 Rand to 30 cents, because they were panicking. And they still have, Coronation still has African bank shares, don't they? Because they couldn't sell them all. We look at them and we think, oh, they're Coronation, they're smart. I'm not calling them stupid, but, but ignore them. We don't care what they're doing. We're not interested in what they're doing. We've got ourselves a system. We've got ourselves a process. We will review that process once a year over the holidays, whenever that may be for you, depending on your, on your personal circumstances. And we won't worry about this supposed spot money or anything like that. We'll just carry on doing what we're doing. This ultimately is all noise. And don't worry about the crooks. There's loads of them. <clears throat> so the point is, focus on the system. Ignore the evidence. Accept the evidence to your system. There's... I was digging around, so the, one of the things that the internet has done, or maybe it's actually cell phones have done it. So remember things like Loch Ness Monsters, Bermuda Triangles, all of those wonderful things? They've all disappeared off the face of the earth. And I'm like, where did they go? And you go, particularly Loch Ness Monster, I mean, the one evidence says, well, 
Loch Ness Monster died, of course. But if you go and you start digging, around 10 or so years ago, all of these stories sort of just, just, they didn't fade away. They like fell off a cliff. They just disappeared. They were no longer in the press or anything like that. And I, and I deep, and I, I, it's either maybe it's telephones, maybe it's internet, maybe it's Facebook, something that happened there, you know, because old Loch Ness Monster, how many people went to the Loch Ness with a camera and got, now, who in this room doesn't have a camera in their pocket? You know, I remember 20 years ago going on holiday, I was the geeky kid, I had a camera, a film camera, you know, a half of the, I had a camera and like I would be the oak with the camera. I could take 24 pictures on my holiday. The entire holiday, 24 pictures. Yeah, <laughs> you see the point. Now suddenly there's just, a, I mean, at any one point there are a thousand cameras at Loch Ness and if there was a Loch Ness monastery, we'd have a proper, we'd have, forget a picture, we'd have an interview with it and you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Focus on system. Focus on what is true and what is real. And what is true and is real is to you as the individual. You've got to decide what matters to you. And if you think that the Santa Rally is an excellent idea and you want to trade it, perfect. Go and do the digging, do the evidence, work out the strategy, make a plan, trade the Santa Rally. Whichever you want. But don't sort of jump on Twitter on the, on the uh, and if I did this, um, was it? No, someone, two weeks ago, someone jumped on Twitter and said, Santa Rally is starting. I'm like, my hot dude, it's middle of November. <laughs> it's bad enough I got Christmas carols at the supermarkets. So we can do anything we want, and I know that boggles our brain. But whatever we do, whether it be poems, whether it be moving averages, whether it be Santa Rallies, we need a process, we need a strategy, we need a plan. We don't just want random... It's me, we must sell. This is my, say, my favorite quote is actually Warren Buffett who says, predicting, what predicting the future tells you more about the person than the future. Um, two things I want to take from it. One, my ability to see the future is exactly 100% zero. That is the same for everybody on this planet. Nobody can see the future. Nobody. Not ever. I, you can't see the future. There was a great TV show back in the 80s. The weird part is he went and solved crimes. I mean, why he just didn't go to the sports pages or the stock market pages, I never understand. But we cannot see the future. Trading is not about predicting. Trading is about probability. If we are trying to predict the future, all we are going to do is cause great pain to our brain and great harm to our pile of money, however big or small it may be. Trading is about probability. And as soon as we are comfortable that it's about probability, suddenly we can almost happily accept the simplicity. Because when we think we have to predict the future, we intuitively know we have to do something that no one in the history of the universe has done. Ah, so I was digging around Nostradamus recently as well, on, on, on Monday for this. And so the astrologists have basically, so Nostradamus predicted stuff about the stars, so that's one of his things that we can really predict, and it turns out his success rate in predicting what the stars would do was zero. He wasn't even a good astrologist. If we're trying to predict the future, we're trying to do something which no one in the history of this planet has ever done before. That's going to scare us, it's going to make us go for complexity. If we're just going to say it's about probability, and probability is easy. I toss a coin, heads or tails, what's the odds? 50-50, we all know that. No rocket science. Boom, we can do probability. As soon as we say it's about probability, suddenly we can take <coughs> the simplicity. If we say it's about predicting, it has to be complex because we've got to do something no one 104 billion people have been born on this planet. None of them have predicted the future. As always, and I, I put this there every session for homework. What are we trading? Why are we trading? How are we trading? These are the things we constantly interrogate. At some point, we stop interrogating and we start writing. We start planning. We start putting systems down. But these are the big questions. What are we trading? What assets? Are we doing derivatives? Yes or no? Why are we trading this and not that, or that and not this. 
And it's not that it's right or wrong. You're interrogating your thought process. If nothing else, you're thinking. Rather than just saying, well, I trade that because Johnny next door trades it. That's not a good answer. And how are you doing it? What time frames are you doing? Why that time frame? Why, if you have a job, are you trying to trade a five-minute chart? If you've got a job, you trade a daily chart or a weekly chart. <coughs> Boring, I know. We want to do our job and trade, but you cannot do two things at the same time. One of them suffers. In truth, both of them suffer. Work your trading around your life. And at some point, you can toss the job in. Fine. But at this point, you've got a life. It's got commitments and required responsibilities. Work your trading around it rather than trying to ram trading through the middle of it and say, my boss won't notice. The only reason your boss won't notice is probably because he's also trading and losing money. <coughs> We're back in the new year, 19th of January, New Year Trading Resolutions. So this is a process I go through every year. Um, what I very purposely don't do is do it now, and this is why we're doing it in January, and we're making it the 19th because people are on holiday and stuff. But you do not want to tie this up with your drunken New Year's resolutions at half past 11 on the 31st of December. Because I ask you a simple question. Did anyone in this room keep one of their resolutions that they made at midnight on 31 December last year? Please, somebody... No? Not a one? Brilliant. Sir, we love you. There's one person. One person. Okay. <laughs> but that's it. So I, what I'm purposely doing is shifting this away from drunken New Year's resolutions where we don't. And I have a reason why we don't, but I'll talk about that. I mean, I'll tell you now quick. So the reason we don't get our New Year's resolutions is because, A, we're drunk. Um, and if we're not drunk, everyone else is drunk. But more importantly, because we make these giant promises to ourselves. And the way of effecting change is not with giant promises. It is with baby steps. Yeah, you want to you you run the comrades. You don't run out and go and run 90 Ks. In my case, if you want to run the comrades, well, first you buy some shoes to run it in. And then you walk around the block very, very slowly. And, and you know, process. Everything is bite-sized steps. And that's what we're going to do about that. How to come to it, how to be disciplined, how to review trading, how to make 2016 our best trading year ever. Not necessarily in terms of profit, in terms of discipline and the like. And then, of course, uh, that one, always the lawyers. I've run my time by a few minutes, but if there are questions, I will grab some questions. Not a one. Excellent. Ladies and gents, sir. Yes. Would you advise us to uh, to stick it out or to just get out and just wait on something? Ignore it. Absolutely, 100% ignore it. I mean, firstly, is it going to happen? So if we go back to December last year, the statistical probability, there's a futures thing, the, the chance of there being a, a, a rate hike in the first quarter of this year was 85%. Well, I mean, it's just the current odds of there being a rate hike in December is 84%. Will it happen? Frankly, it's 50-50. What will the market do? There will be a short-term response uh, in the immediate. I mean, when I say short-term, for maybe a couple of hours, maybe a few days, there will be response. But who on this planet is not expecting a Fed rate hike, if not December, soon? Now, I'm hoping like hell not, because I have a bottle of whiskey. I said no rate hike this year. And I don't mind losing bets, but I hate losing bets at like the last minute. But ignore it. It's just not there. If it comes, we don't know if it will, the market will do one of three things, up, down, or sideways. And if you've stopped out, you're out. And if you're in, you're in. Uh, you respond to it rather than try and preempt it. Okay. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. The videos are online. This one will be online shortly. Uh, two things to finish with. Really appreciate the support for 2015, not just at the IG boot camps, but across just one lap generally, the part, just everything. It's really great to, to, to see people coming out and, and paying attention. Um, and I hope you all have a, 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 an awesomely brilliant holidays. And I hope that we all have an even better 2016. Thank you very much for your time this evening and over the year. Thank you.